Okay, so in the last video, we looked at how to use the Gemini 2.5 Pro to do audio transcription, etc. And some of the questions asked about how can we do this with video? And I mentioned in the video actually that I would do a follow up talking about doing it with YouTube. So this is that video. Okay, so if we want to do it with video, we've got a couple of options. And if we wanted to do it with YouTube videos in particular, the first is you need to either download the video somehow and then just upload it as a file. Generally, I tend to use an MP4 file, but you can see here that there's a number of different file formats that are supported for videos. But just like we talked about with the audio, you want to use the files API to actually upload that file. And then once you've got it uploaded, you can basically just pass the file in as part of the prompt. And this is one of the cool things, which is very easy to do with the Gemini and the AI studio endpoint is this whole file API for uploading this kind of thing. Now, just like I mentioned with the audio files, you can do it in line, but the challenge is going to be that your video has to be below 20 meg, which for many videos, you're often just not going to get it that small. If you are doing a sort of HD video and it's more than a few minutes long kind of thing. Now there are some tricks that you can do if you've got raw video. One of the things you can do is actually split it out to be audio and image files. So one of the things I used to do in the past before these models supported videos is I would basically use OpenCV to sample out an image every one second. And then I would use a similarity metric to compare the images and only upload the images that are substantially different than the image before. And I would upload that with its timestamp to be able to do that. Now, luckily, most of the time you don't need to do that anymore. You can just go straight for basically using the files API, uploading your video. Now, recently, one of the things that Google added to this was the ability to upload a YouTube video, but to do it by just passing in the YouTube URL. So basically what happens here is that they will go and get that video for you. Now, it must be a publicly listed video. It can't be a private video. It can't be an unlisted video. And you can see that this is kind of still in preview in that they haven't decided any pricing or rate limits for this. The current sort of main limitation is that you can only upload up to eight hours of YouTube video per day. So if you're doing like three hour podcasts, you're going to run into issues there that we wouldn't have run into if we just were doing the audio, etc. Another limitation is that you can only do one video per request. And that might seem obvious for YouTube, and I think it is for YouTube. But one of the cool things that you can do with just the normal video upload is you can do things like where you can upload multiple videos that way. But for example, if you had video of users testing out your product, you could actually upload many of those videos and get Gemini to look at all those videos in one shot and extract out the commonalities of where people had problems or where people slowed down, where there was friction, that kind of thing. So that actually can be really cool uploading multiple videos. Now, the way those videos that you're going to upload are actually calculated is it works out to be 258 tokens per frame. And then you've still got the 32 tokens per second for the audio. And then they also factor in some metadata and other things in there. So if you are uploading your own video, you can probably fit about an hour of video into the actual contact length in there. All right. Now the way that you do it with the YouTube URL is you still want to basically pass that in as a particular file data type. So you can see here that what we can do is we're passing in our prompt with this types dot part with text. And then we've got this second one where we've got this file data and that file data is going to basically have a file URI, which is going to be the YouTube URL in there. Now, as we saw in the previous one, the models are actually quite good at being able to do the minutes and seconds out for sort of timestamps, et cetera. I'll show you that in a second in the code. But then you can also ask them to basically do sort of visual Q and A and provide visual descriptions, et cetera. And I actually talked about this way back in one of the videos about Gemini 1.5 when it came out, where I had a video of Jeff Dean and I got it to go through and analyze that. Uh, but back then it couldn't do the audio. I think it could only do images at the time. Now, yet again, you'll see that the Gemini 2.0 models and the Gemini 2.5 models 
actually just much better at this task than the previous models were. So one of the things I want to show you is that we'll use the video that I did for the audio transcription. But one of the things that we can actually do now is not just get out timestamps and stuff like that. We can ask it to basically watch the video and get extract the code from the video. So let's say I hadn't shared the collab or anything, and hopefully all of you know that I share the collabs in the description so you can check them out, etc. But if I hadn't, you can actually use this to go through and extract out the code visually from the video itself. All right, let's jump into the code and have a look at how to do all that. Okay, so this notebook is kind of similar to what we already did with the audio one. The key thing here is basically just sort of setting it up, but a couple of things different. So let's sort of go through it. So you can see I'm basically just installing stuff. I'm bringing in my key for AI Studio setting up a client, et cetera, in here. And then the first one I'm showing is basically using a prompt from one of the Gemini DevRel examples. Now to actually generate out the text, you can see here that we've got our prompt and we're gonna basically just pass that in. And we're bringing in this, this types thing from the Gen AI SDK. So we can have sort of like types as being text, types as being file data, et cetera. Now, when we're making the content, here you can see we're just instantiating this content and then passing in the parts to it. So we'll assemble it like we did if we were just doing the sort of uploads or something. But in this way, we don't need to do the upload. It's going to basically go and get the file for us. It's going to bring all of that back for us in here. So you can see we're using the Gemini 2.5 Pro model. All right. We've got our text prompt and then we've got the actual YouTube URL. And sure enough, it goes off. And it gives us a pretty good description about that video, right? So I'm presuming that you kind of watched the previous video at this point. And it sort of sums up what was about it, if there was a call to action, that kind of thing. Now you can play around with this prompt as much as you want, right? Really this prompt should be something that you should customize yourself. Often I will want summaries in a certain way. You can even do things like where I'll tell it, hey, if it's a tutorial, then do this. If it's just covering news, then give me the output like this and put that in a prompt and that can work, you know, quite well as well. And you can see sure enough that this model is very good at generating Markdown out. So if we take that and just sort of display it as Markdown, we can see quite nicely what it is. Okay. Now, if we take the one that I used for the audio, the only thing I'm changing here is to generate a transcript of the video and. I pass in the speaker's name, it's going to be Sam, obviously this time passing the same thing. We can see that sure enough, it goes through and gives us that the same kind of detailed transcript out like we got with the audio one. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually then run it through the code that I put in the previous notebook for simplifying it down so that we were only getting a timestamp every 30 seconds, unless a different person spoke or anything. In this case, I was the only person speaking in the video, probably a bit over the top to have it do it every couple of seconds or something in here. One of the things though, that you will often want, and you can do this quite easily with things like HTML is that if you're going to display this on a page or something, you might want it so that people could click this. So let's say, you know, this bit here, right? I've sort of pre-done this one. You can see here, okay, we've got a timestamp of 1423. And Sam says now that one of you, you can sort of experiment again, right? We've got that there. So if we take this, basically this code here is just for converting that timestamp from being a string into something we can then basically pass in and display. And you'll see that like, if we take that 14, 23, and we now run this in, what it's basically going to do is go get the YouTube video, etc. but it's going to set the start time at that 1423. So when I click it, because it's sure enough here down at the bottom that it started at 1423 and I'll turn down the audio, but I'll turn on this and you can see that sure enough, we've got that now that one can sort of experiment is what we saw as the transcript from that before. So that's working really well. One of the things I'm not hundred percent sure is, are they actually pulling in the transcripts as metadata and injecting that into the prompt? 
I've heard conflicting things about that, so I'm not sure just how well that works. The way to test it really would be to take a video that we know doesn't have subtitles, etc., and be able to use that. See, there's lots of other metadata in there that we put for what each section was about going on in there. All right, so the last one I wanted to show you is, in some ways, I think kind of perhaps the coolest thing. Like, I think the other ones we kind of expect that were going to work. This one, I wasn't sure if it was going to work, and it may not work all the time, but it works really nicely on this video. So what I've basically got now as a prompt is analyze the following YouTube video content. Please extract, and then I've put code that is shown in the Colab Jupyter Notebook, not in documentation. So if you think back to that video, there was some code that was in the docs, and then there was the code in the actual collab that I walked through for the second half of the video. So I don't really want the code from the docs part. I want it from where I was actually showing the collab, et cetera, as we're going through that. So anyway, we run this and you can see, I'll just scroll up so you can see that sure enough, it goes through and then each cell, it's basically extracting out what was in the cell. Now, I could probably prompt it to sort of merge it and stuff like that. I've just got it to give us the code with the three back ticks. And you can see that obviously we got that from the prompt up there. And it looks pretty good, right? It seems to have extracted out everything that we had in there pretty much correctly. I'm not seeing any errors sort of looking at this from what was in there. And if you think about it, just like this video, it wasn't like I showed the entire code at one point in time. I was sort of slowly scrolling through it, sometimes scrolling up, sometimes scrolling down. So for it to sort of work out sequentially what code goes where and get the whole sort of thing of like, okay, where I change the various things in there to process the transcript, etc. It's done a really nice job of sort of being able to get all of that out from there and not give us the outputs, just give us the code. Right. So it's not like it's sort of just OCR'd everything on screen. It's kind of done it in a very intelligent way to extract out the code from that. Now you can see sure enough, if we basically display that as markdown, we lose the three back ticks in the Python and we just get the code itself coming out there. So that for me is really cool is that if you've got a tutorial that you really like or something and they haven't given you the code. Or on the very rare occasion, I forget to update the link or something and the link actually goes to the wrong code. You could certainly do this as a way to basically extract out the code so that you can try it out yourself and use it. I think this is something that really is kind of cool just to sort of think about that this is basically working out what is that code flow and being able to sort of do that over time. There's definitely a sort of temporal element going on there that it needs to work out that, okay, it's not just OCRing each frame, it's putting it all together to be able to do this. So this has become my sort of default way of dealing with YouTube URLs. I still have some pipelines where I download it and stuff like that. I think it's against YouTube terms of service for me to actually show that. So I don't want to sort of show that in the video. But this way is being supported both in AI Studio, in Vertex. You can try it out. You can imagine that you could sort of repurpose this for any kind of video. If it was a cooking video and they're showing like the ingredients as they sort of drop them into the pan with a little sort of note about them or something like that, you could have it just go through and extract out those ingredients and basically assemble the recipe in a written form for you. We really are in amazing times that we can get these things to do these kind of tasks where it's going beyond just transcription or even sort of visual question answering, but being able to extract things temporally over the video and then assemble it in a way that we can use it. Anyway, have a play with the notebook. You don't need to go and actually do this for this notebook. I will put it in the description as I always do. I'd love to hear different ideas of how people think that they can use this themselves. I really kind of feel a lot of these things now are coming down to sort of the creative uses of how to do some of these things much more than the technical implementation of it. Like I've shown you in this video, it's pretty simple sort of code to do it. And once you've sort of got it down, you just can just reuse it as much as you want. I think the really sort of interesting thing is coming with up with the creative ideas of where you could use it for different things to be able to extract that out. 
And I know I've certainly been experimenting with different things for things like Loom videos, where I'll just make a quick video for my team, and then I'll run it through this and give them sort of written instructions as well as the actual video to watch for what I want them to do or for a particular feedback on a particular project or something like that. So I'd love to hear from you guys. If you've done anything like this already, what are you using it for? And if you haven't done it yet, what do you think would be the most sort of interesting use cases for this kind of thing? Anyway, as always, please put comments, questions, etc., in the comments below. If you like the video, please click like and subscribe, and I will talk to you in the next video. Bye for now.